It is 2.02 p.m. and you are listening to Radical Minds on WHPK 88.5 FM Chicago, the pride of the South Side. Radical Minds investigates the interlocking political, economic, and social problems facing modern society for a ruthless critique of everything existing. We are an ongoing conversation of activists, academics, and intellectuals on questions pertinent to the left, past, present, and future. I'm your host, Erin Haygood, and I'm in the studio today with my co-host, Stephanie Gomez, and we will be uh, interviewing uh, Matthew J.C. and Greg Lucero um, about, I mean, we're going to talk about a lot of things, but um, so just a bit of background, um, you know, uh, Matt works at UPS and is involved in the union there, and he does platypus down in uh, Knoxville, and then... Uh, Greg is, he started Revolutionary Chicago. I know he's part of the campaign, uh, or he's related to the campaign of the Socialist Party and Chicago against police brutality, um, you know, right in our city. Um, and so we have them on the phone, but um, actually you guys can call in if you want. So I just wanted to read out the number in case you want to call in and ask our guests any questions because we're going to be feeding basically Stephanie's cell phone through the um, aux cord. And so our phone will be open because, you know, in the past we've done phone interviews that hasn't been possible. So um, you can call us at 773-702-8424. That's 773-702-8424. Um, and so I think we're going to get started. Um, so, uh, Stephanie, I'll let you take it away. All right. Um, hey, Matthew. Hey, Greg. Um, before we begin, did you guys want to, like, add any sort of introduction about yourselves and, like, what you do, like, in relation to, um, the social, like, um, just ask social the social yeah. yeah. Um, go ahead. Hey, guys. Thanks. Um, so I guess I've prepared a bit of a rant about who I am and how I came to be on this call with you and with Greg, but it may be a bit more elaborate than what you've asked for here. So I guess I'm going to defer to Greg, and then afterwards I might riff off of uh, uh, what he says. Well, I thank you for deferring to me, and especially uh, setting a tirade uh, for later, since I'm likely to be the target of it. Um, I don't really have much else to say right now. I'm mostly uh, working with the Teamsters, working uh, with Chicago Against Police Brutality, trying to build a revolutionary Chicago, and I've been uh, a union member of one union or, or another for at least uh, eight years, so, for what it's worth. Also, um, I guess I'll just add here real quick that uh, I know you guys all probably know me as Matthew J.C. Uh, since the bulk of our interaction has been online, and that's fine. Uh, you can call me that if you want. But that's really just an effort to throw employers for a loop on my Facebook. So my real name is Matthew Capagrotti, or Matt for short. And I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, which is home to our state's flagship university, where I first got involved in the Platypus Affiliated Society about four years ago. Um, I'm also an editor of its monthly journal, The Platypus Review as well as a new employee at UPS. So I'm quite new to Teamsters and union politics. I'm much more familiar with socialist politics and its historical relationship with labor. So I guess uh, for our listeners, just try and keep that in mind throughout our discussion. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, so both of you wanted to talk today about your involvement in UPS and how it's sort of like offered a, a possibility for exploring labor politics um, through the union organizational activity that's going on right now. Did you want to explain to the listeners like what's going on in UPS right now and why you decided to start working there? Yeah, Greg, you want to kick that off? 
Yeah, um, I will uh, take that off happily. So UPS, um, most people don't realize, is one of the most central businesses of the United States. They handle generally uh, 7 to 11 percent of America's GDP. That doesn't mean it's their final resting point, but just it's transported through UPS. This makes them vital to uh, the U.S. economy. Um, and, uh, they're one of the, they are, I just, I have to check, and SEIU is kind of up in the air because it's private and public. They are the largest public, or uh, private union, uh, in the country, which means they don't have to worry about, uh, the upcoming Janet versus AFSCME that makes all, uh, public unions right to work. So, um, being uh, a troublemaker that I am, and, uh, as, as our good friend Matthew here, um, is also uh, trying to make um, some problems. Um, UPS is the key union uh, to the U.S. economy. And as such, um, it has uh, contract negotiations every roughly five years. Um, the leadership of uh, UPS uh, locally is independent, so I'm not including our local UPS leadership in this. Um, but lo- uh, nationally and internationally, um, it's terrible. It's run by Jimmy Hoffa Jr. And so, uh, as, as a radical, uh, labor organizer, I'm part of Teachers for Democratic Unions trying to get this union into, uh, fighting shape. And so I'm just working, uh, as hard as I can on Jeff Hub, uh, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, whoever I can to build, uh, the, the labor stru- the teamster struggle and hopefully uh, build that into the wider labor struggle. Yeah, um, I guess I'll just piggyback off that a little bit and explain how Greg and I both came to be on this call together. So I did freelance work for a long time, too long, really, uh, which is part of the gig economy, of course, and I got tired of the inconsistency. So I decided to get something steady. And when I threw a line out about that, Greg bit and he was like, Hey, you should work for UPS. It's got pretty good benefits. Plus there's the union, uh, which he specifically pitched to me as a place where I could develop my understanding of radical politics and its relationship to organized labor. Uh, actually he was even a little bit more explicit about it than that. Uh, he essentially said, look, I know the state or organized labor in this country is pretty bad, but to the extent that it persists, this is a place where it could potentially be developed. Now, Greg knows full well that what I do with Platypus is an attempt to create the conditions where that could be done more effectively. Uh, But he was also like, at the end of the day, somebody's going to have to do that work. And, you know, there's some truth to that. Uh, And he didn't sugarcoat it to me either. He told me right out the door, This job sucks. It's hard fucking work. And the state of the union is in bad shape. And I hate to preempt Greg here, because I know he loves to talk shit about this, but Jimmy Hoffa's son runs our union. Now, on on one hand, I'm an Italian, so I'm kind of ambivalent about that. But, you know, on the other, I'm a socialist, and I understand that's pretty fucked up. So, um, I've also watched enough of the HBO series the wire, to understand how this kind of thing could still happen. Today, it's not just greed. I mean, it's that too, but unions are also desperate. They need support, and in some cases, they'll take it even if it's the wrong time. So, I guess after all these years of being run like a racket with organized crime, it's not hard for me to imagine how this could still be the case. Uh, but basically, Greg was like, maybe we can leverage these liabilities into an asset. I mean, if nobody really cares about union politics anymore, it's not that crazy to picture the few who do having some outsized impact on them. So I'd like to see if we can strike over this contract. Uh, I think that'd be pretty interesting. So I told him, okay, I need a good job. And if I can educate myself politically in the process, then I don't know. Let's give this a go. All right. Thank you. So I do want to talk definitely about like what 
Matthew, you talked about, about possibilities for like the organization of a party and like just like interacting with like the UPS union struggle as like a way of gauging like the possibilities in the present for socialist politics and like socialist consciousness and the workers. But before I get to that, I wanted to address something really quickly that you talked about, Greg. Um, you said that you think the UPS union is a key union um, for the US economy because of the amount of GDP handled by UPS company. So I was wondering like, what is the significance of like this relationship between the possibilities for like labor politics in UPS and like um, what you see as a concentration of capital in UPS? What's the relationship between like capital and like politics there for you? Yeah, well, um, if you'll pardon me for waxing a, a little philosophical or a little, little theoretical, we're talking about the GDP of the United States. Um, we're talking about imperialism. Uh, you know, complex, uh, the double exploitation of labor, yada, 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 exploit, exploit, ex, sorry, uh, ex exploitive, exploitative and surplus value, et cetera, et cetera. Um, put real simply, uh, people in other countries make this stuff that we use. And by we, I mean the United States. I don't mean we as in, uh, the rest of the people who live on the south side of Chicago. Um, so it, it's exploitation, right? Well, when you're taking, when the U.S. is taking people's stuff, it needs a way to get things here. UPS is a means to get things here. And so, therefore, it forms a key link um, between the U.S. and the world economy through the exploitation that happens in other countries and then shifts here. Um, this forms a, 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 a different and interesting relationship uh, with um, the capital inside the United States, because unlike, um, you know, the, the factory closures of uh, the 80s to, well, still ongoing, um, it's impossible for capitalism to get rid of uh, some mechanism to deliver the stuff that it pillages. And so UPS is that pillage, or that point, that um, that narrow chain, that lifeblood of capitalism that exists, and, um, you know, the goal is to stop it, um, if that makes sense. Um, so, I mean, that, that's the general view of how I personally view where, well, why UPS is important, especially when you have the, uh, the industrialization of the Midwest, for example. Um, but uh, I, I'm I'm sorry, I go on and on. Um, do you have some specific questions about that, or what I'm going to do about it, or what what we hope to achieve, or so on and so forth? Well, I guess, Greg, one thing that I wanted to ask about that actually was in terms of imperialism, uh, which you brought up. Uh, so do you see UPS as kind of basically some sort of like strategic way of combating imperialism specifically? And then how would that link up to building some sort of mass socialist party in the U.S., but also on an international basis? Maybe if you could just elaborate on that a bit more um, for our listeners. Yeah, that's that's a, a very good question. Um so imperialism, right? It has to it has to get stuff that you're stealing back to the people who are stealing it, and we see this happen all the time. You, the U.S. imperializes all places of the world uh, to greater or lesser degree. Uh, China, for example, which we get a lot of stuff shipped for you. Yes, um, Africa. You know, you, you just name it. If there are factories, primarily U.S. factories, in a country producing stuff that's sold here, that is being shipped, and it doesn't have its own supply chain, then UPS is the main that shows the supply chain. In addition, um, which is really important to the question of imperialism, this is something that most people don't realize. Also, with the shipping of products and whatnot, there are notes. If you want to ship something overnight through UPS, you ship it through these small packages. They come in uh, every day. They're contracts. They're financial negotiations and financial pools that the U.S. corporations, large corporations in the U.S. use to, well, strangle the world. And, you know, it's basic imperialism. We don't have to get into all that. But UPS 
is the company uh, that does this. The Teamsters and UPS are the workers that do this labor. And so strategically, there's where the chokehold is. There's where we say, this can possibly, and um, I and Matt are trying our hardest to make it, uh, this is a place where we can stop the flow of capital from the periphery, exploited country, to the exploiter countries, most notably the U.S., and fight for the workers who uh, have to actually do the stuff throughout. So that's one. Two is what party or either nationally or internationally can we build? Unfortunately, I'm uh, deeply pessimistic about such a thing. Um, and I wish that there were, I wish that there was a communist party in the United States. And I know that there are people who are communists. I know there are people who are part of parties. And I know those parties and those people do very good things across the country. But there is not anything that is sufficient to be called a communist party. And I would like to see it emerge. And one way it can emerge is through the labor struggles and strikes um, that we've seen the teachers engage in, and hopefully we see the teamsters engage in, and hopefully something out of this uh, party can be built. But the thing is, I'm not holding my breath, and so I'm doing what I can do right now to stop the U.S. imperialism, and it's, it's very little, and I'm one guy, uh, now two, with uh, Matt here. Um, but I think we've got a chance, and even if we don't, it's the best in my view, that we can do. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. So real quick, we're going to do a PSA just because we have to do them over the radio, and then Stephanie's going to ask the next question. Um, so probably isn't okay when it comes... Uh, one more probably isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Um, and now I'm just going to hand it back to you all. Hey, all right. So um, I wanted to kind of follow up to what you were just talking about, Greg. Um, you were talking about how, like, um, through UPS and, and this particular union, um, that the workers are in, like, a particularly advantageous position to, like, potentially, um, you know, gain control over the means of production in a really significant way. And so I wanted to talk about... Um, the what's what's politically involved in that um at, at this moment in particular and like um i wanted to maybe like start by looking back on a few examples in um the history of the 20th century left and labor organizing um me and aaron were talking about it earlier and we were thinking about you know um the example of like the 70s moment with um the attempt to proletarianize the u.s workforce um as workers were entering into the factory um, and so, like, we were wondering, like, you know, um, what sort of, like, example, like, that moment might um, provide for us in terms of, like, what's possible for labor organizing. And also, um, we were thinking about, like, the transitional program, which is a much different program, like, what, which is a much different moment. Like, um, you know, Trotsky's plan for the workers to um, essentially, like, gain political power in the factory. And... So, yeah, just, like, thinking about the sort of, like, recent history of labor organizing, like, how is that influencing the way that you guys are thinking about labor organizing now and, like, what's possible? And maybe we can start, actually, with, because I know Matt wanted to talk about the new communist movement in the 70s. So just a bit of background for our listeners um, in the 70s. And this is what Stephanie was kind of suggesting. Um, uh, a lot of leftists ended up kind of, they proletarianized themselves, they entered the workforce so that they could get closer to the unions, to the laborers, and try and organize workers that way. Um, so, you know, it, this sounds very similar to what Matt's doing with UPS. Um, to some extent, though, of course, I mean, he just needed a job too, so maybe not. <laughs> um, uh, but we were wondering, you know, are conditions different today than in the 70s? How, you know, how did entering the factories um, uh, further the goal of socialism then? And uh, can it do so now and like how? That's a really interesting question, I think, because the legacy of it is so ambiguous. I mean, it's not really self-evident that it had any kind of lasting impact, uh, except maybe the fact that the few people who were still sort of hanging around in organized labor that came out of these efforts are the people who worked their way up into the, the labor bureaucracy 
and who have become entirely conservative and are now thus part of the problem. Um, now, I can only presume they joined these unions uh, not out of bad faith, uh, but because they were disciplined revolutionaries. So when their parties told them, uh, there is no class consciousness in this country anymore. Uh, we got to go where working people are uh, and rebuild it from the ground up. And that's what you're going to do now. That, well, then they listened. And what do you do when the global movement for socialism collapses from underneath you in the process? I don't know. You make the best of it, I guess. And you know, that's what they did. But it, that doesn't mean that it hasn't become a kind of identity politics for them at this point. You know, like being the old school union steward from some Trotskyist sect out of the, six, uh, the 70s. Uh, I wouldn't at all be surprised if they took young socialists attempting to organize in their unions as cramping their style. Uh, that's their shtick, you know? Uh, but if I may, I'd like to just say a couple of things about the difference between what they were doing and now. And the first is obviously that a college degree is no longer a ticket to the professional class. So unlike the new left, uh, Greg and I, it's not really the case that Greg and I are acquiescing to something here. Uh, maybe he decided to forego a proper white collar professional career. I don't know. He'll have to tell you, but I haven't been really been able to find anything better. So. I don't see what I'm doing here as any kind of noble sacrifice. Uh, don't get me wrong. As long as I'm doing it, I'm not going to half-ass it. But it's still an experiment. Uh, the new communist movement, on the other hand, uh, didn't see it that way at all. Uh, they understood themselves as entering into a very specific project, which was based off the Communist Party's practice from the 1930s through the 1950s, of sending out party organizers to take up working class jobs uh, so that they could recruit them to the party. And this is important because in many ways, it means that what they were modeling their project after was potentially already obsolete. The new left had an opportunity to take the steam built by the political wave of the 1960s and capitalize on it. And in fact, tried to do so. Uh, it was the so-called Marxist turn, uh, where you had all of these different Marxist sects uh, popping up, trying to build a mass party. And it was part of their getting serious about politics. Um, and maybe Greg can talk a little bit more about this. But, you know, by the time they decided to turn to industry in the mid to late 70s, uh, it's to my understanding that that moment had you know, kind of already passed. So there's that. Uh, and in a way, the fragmented nature of the left today kind of appears to be, you know, maybe just an extension of that sectarianism uh, of this period. But I don't think this is just a problem of like personal temperament for them of, like, being overly disagreeable and whatnot? Uh, no. They were dealing with an immense historical obstacle, uh, which was the inability for the Communist Party to hegemonize the American left uh, in the wake of the Khrushchev revelation of Stalin's crimes and in uh, the aftermath of the Hungarian Revolution. Uh which I'm sure all produced uh, real differences uh, to serious questions of uh, revolutionary leadership between them. Uh, and I think that we're actively carrying out the bad legacy of this moment, and it's shaping the way that we approach these problems. Uh, and there are a lot of underlying theoretical assumptions behind them that go unquestioned, uh, which play out in ways that we don't necessarily recognize or understand. And that's what I personally took up this experiment to explore. Um, Greg, if I may, 
Um, yeah, I think that was really good. And, uh, you know, it, we got to think critically about this. Um, if you look at the 70s, and it was primarily uh, the mid to late 70s that uh, I'm moderately familiar with various Trotskyist uh, sects. Um, the, the two I'm most familiar with um, during this period was uh, the Revolutionary Workers' Headquarters and the uh, Revolutionary Communist Party, um, which was Malice, is now, uh, we'll say, a vacant or whatever. Um, and what they did is they went into the, the factories everywhere. And uh, they went into the factories because, hey, you know, I'm a first labor party. Hey, uh, we're, we want to be workers. So being a worker means you work in a factory. So we're going to join these and join the union and blah, blah, blah. We're going to fuse. Um, by and large, what it was was it was uh, a failure to recognize um, the double failure of the left in the late 60s, early 70s. The political project of the left had failed, and so uh, they wanted to do something that would keep it alive. Well, so you get a bunch of, you, you know, I, I just interestingly enough read um, uh, some uh, some commentary, uh, some platypus, I might add. Uh, it was on, uh, I forget his name, but he was the, the, the he was one of the chair people of um, the Weather Underground, and now he's like, I'm a liberal Democrat. Um, I didn't know uh, what I was doing. My was an answer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, while his life is very storied, it's, it also is emblematic of the left from the period. Uh, in the late 60s, the early 70s, um, there was the, the revolution was just around the corner. Uh, it was just about to happen, um, you know. Um, it didn't, as, as we unfortunately know. Um, and most of them, uh, gave up and, uh, they joined, for them joining the labor unions was, uh, really a throwback to the 1930s the Communist Party that, well, I'm, I'm part of the labor union, I, blah, blah, blah. It, it doesn't matter. Um, to be honest, uh, that whole motion and movement, uh, to join the labor movement, uh, was just uh, a, a way to, to accept the bitter pill of defeat. Um, today, uh, just just to say, um, I don't think we have that option. Um, by which I mean to say, uh, I don't think that oh well, we unnamed masses are going to enter the labor unions and we're going to rise up, and then they'll be the glorious institution of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, no, what I think is labor unions are in such a bad way now that this Kingster contract, right? Janice versus asks me, all public unions are going to go right to work. Trump has made sure of that. So if they're all going right to work, what is the, then they're going to look to the, the largest single private union to set the stage um, and to set the tenor for how it's going to be. You see all these, uh, the educator strikes in West Virginia, in Arizona, they're good. I, I'm not in any way saying they're not good, but what they are is potentially the last gap of these unions where they haven't gone on strike, they haven't fought for their workers, and now they're desperately clinging to some way to get people to still pay dues. Here in uh, Chicago, uh, SEIU has fired like 50 people from their staff, and they know that Janice is coming down. This is the difference. Um, when they left the streets, they left the protest, um, they stopped organizing, and they joined the union. The unions were there. It, they were relatively good pay. They were relatively prominent and relatively good position that their friends were in. So they, they became uh, an, an also runner up, uh, also runner up prize. Um, that's not what the unions are today. Um, and you can talk to Matt. Um, being a teamster is not, it's not an easy job at UPS. 
They make sure it's not an easy job. Um, and rather than uh, uh, some grandiose strategy, um, I see it personally that now we're just, and I'm sorry if I, I firmly disagree with Matt, or, or maybe we agree, but just saying it bluntly, uh, and Matt, you can talk about how I talked to you uh, to rope you into this deal. Um, this is it. Um, this is it for labor unions. The Teamsters are the last, and for now, like, I'm, this is the last time that they're going to bargain from a place of power. And if they, if we take a bad contract, then that's it. Labor's done. Roll up the, the carpet. Um, it's going away. And so I, unlike, uh, the seventies where they viewed it as, oh, well, we can, we can do something. Uh, my politics has failed. Black nationalism has failed. Well, I'll go into the union because that's the way to go. That's not, that's not where we are, unfortunately. And so I, I'm sorry. I do go on. I, I think I basically answered, uh, the question, but please, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And I guess I'd just like to respond to that quickly and mention that with respect to what Greg just said, uh, there was a really sizable strike in the shipping industry in the late 1990s uh, when Adolph Reed uh, was organizing the U.S. Labor Party. And uh, Adolph Reed was also a part of the new communist movement in the 1970s. And uh, he's now a professor of political science uh, at the University of Pennsylvania and is a uh, key intellectual figure in the uh, Marxist socialist left today. Uh, but in the 90s, uh, around this strike and around uh, the prospect of a labor party, uh, there were a lot of leftists involved in this. And this was kind of a moment. Uh, it might have had some potential. It was at least a national issue at the time not unlike the recent teacher strikes, as Greg mentioned. Now, I will say that I'm aware of the dissenting argument about what we're trying to do, uh, which is that the moment for potentially disrupting capitalism with UPS uh, has passed, meaning that not only is it not 1996 anymore, uh, but I'm not sure that UPS has ever been a hotbed for socialist organizing. Uh, I, I know that the uh, Maoist Freedom Road Socialist Organization uh, took over a Teamsters local or two. Uh, for example, Richard Berg, where you all are in Chicago, founded Teamsters for a Democratic Union, and he was also part of the Labor Party initiative with Reed. Uh, but that obviously went nowhere, except arguably the Democratic Party. Uh, and the second conjecture is that the concentration of organized labor in the shipping industry has now been eclipsed by Amazon, which is 99% non-union. Uh, so maybe there is considerably less disruptive potential today. And that's what I want to find out. So the question for me is whether the defeat of the Labor Party uh, was entirely a failure of leadership, as in it in fact did not want to lead. And do we have any reason to believe that uh, it would do differently today? Or do we have any reason to believe that socialists would do so any differently today? Uh, which is also to ask, do socialists really want to take power? Uh, that being said, large strikes can happen. Uh, the problem is leadership. Uh, they can Strikes can be very easily manipulated against the self-interests of these unions, against the working class, and against the demand for socialism. And I'm convinced that this has so thoroughly taken place over the last 30 or 40 years, since the new communist movement, uh, that now the answer is no. Uh, socialists don't want to take power. Uh, I think the left today talks a lot of shit about revolution, uh, 
but it's perfectly happy to tail the Democratic Party and other bourgeois uh, reformism to manage capitalism more efficiently, uh, which they'll tell you is about creating social democracy as a precondition for building socialism. Uh, but personally, I think they're full of shit and they don't want anything to do with social transformation and, in fact, no longer think it's even possible. OK, um, well, I think that actually kind of leads me to like, what I wanted to talk about next, which was um, I wanted to go back to the um, transitional program and um, how Trotsky talks about um, factory committees as a sort of like. Um, at, like, like, extension, extension of the party, of the um, like, like, essentially, essentially you're organizing, organizing workers in the factory to, like, take, take political power, um, over the factory as, like, a means of engaging, um, the workers in, um, a daily struggle for, like, not only, like, their immediate, like, working conditions, but in the struggle for socialism at the same time, in the international struggle for it, um, and... Yeah, just the idea of like taking power and political power in the workplace. Cause like earlier Greg talked about like, you know, how the union, like the kind of scope of the union's goals in the moment has more, has to do with like kind of like signing contracts and like, um, you know, making deals with like the owners of like the workplace and, um, government officials. And I was wondering like, what do you see, um, as possible in the present in terms of like, organizing workers in the workplace, not just to like, you know, uh, make decisions like bureaucratically, but to actually like take power. And like, I mean, because that would be doing something very new and different in relation to like the recent left, the new left. And, um, you know, that would, in, in a way it might appear that's like, you know, going back to like a moment that's not possible anymore, but like, um, yeah, I just like, you know, were you going to follow up to that, Erin? Oh, I can. I mean, really, the question is just, it's kind of what I posed earlier, I suppose, but how do you take an end and make that into a beginning? Um, or how is, like, what y'all are doing different from the 70s, like, really explicitly in terms of its, like, goal and, like, its overall, the overall strategy? Uh, Matt, do you want to lead off, or do you want me? We're simultaneously passing it off to one another. Uh, sure, why don't you go ahead? Well, um, so there's a couple different things. Uh, the first is, uh, you know, labor committees. Um, labor committees are a great idea, um, and they have no relevance to us whatsoever today at all. Um, there is no labor committee. There's no labor committee uh, in the union. Uh, if we try to start a labor committee, um, they would go, huh, what are you doing? You're kind of a weirdo. Why, why are you starting this new committee? To be fair, the Teamsters uh, had had that, and had it, it still survives, and it still theoretically, I, I think it's doing good work uh, with caveat with Teamsters for a Democratic Union. Um, that is uh, the TDU. Um, my estimation is to take control of the union. And then by taking control of the union, uh, to fight the bosses and then maybe take control, uh, from there. Um, whether or not that happens or, uh, whether that's still the goal, because, uh, TDU had, had, a, a very strong trust get informed. Um, I, there's actually the package team, uh, written, uh, by Joe, uh, something or other. I don't remember his name, but he's, he's a trust. He's actually very, a very good, uh, a little concise history of UPS. Um, but as far as us getting factory, um, or factory committee, it's not going to happen. And, uh, it, it, it's not even in the realm of, of possibility to float to people that they might get the idea. Um, it's a fight just to get people to go to the regular union meetings. Um, people have little to no interest in attending more meetings outside of that. That being said, um, at least in our local, um, and that's uh, Chicago, and I'm in Jeff Hub, uh, Jefferson Street, uh, where there are some people that they are not, they are not radical, they don't want to be revolution, 
but they are union stewards and they are good. And so, um, what I do is I file grievances. The, the one really good thing about our contract, uh, and I, I say one good, really good thing, and it may be the only, I mean, maybe there's a few others, but like the one key sticking point is supervisors working. In that, you file a grievance, you saw a supervisor working from some, sometimes to sometimes. Okay. You get paid overtime for all the times the supervisor's working. This becomes a mechanism for A, engaging the union because you have to file the report with the steward and you get to know the steward, et cetera, et cetera. And also, um, it becomes a way for me to, uh, reach out to other people, um, in my, in my, uh, section, small sort. I say, hey, how about I, I, I'll take the supervisor, I'll file when the full-time supervisor's, uh, working, you take the part-time supervisor, a, you get paid for it, and B, I think I'll, I'll get ahead. And so we make a little game of it, and then I get all the people I'm trying, I get several people to file on the supervisors. It, it, it's not a factory committee. It, it, the political dimension of it is minuscule. But what they know is, hey, I get paid for supervisors violating the contract. I'm going to mark it down that the supervisor is violating the contract. This is the main mechanism by which I engage the people around me. I'm always willing to sign on a witness. Um, if I have a higher seniority, I don't take because uh, the, the grievance goes to whoever has the seniority. I don't take the grievance and say that I saw it uh, and, and file it as my own. I witness it for them. Um, and that's the rough the rough equivalent of the best we can do that kind of basically fills the role of factory committees, but as far as actual factory committees, then having any life whatsoever, maybe in other local they do, but they sure don't here. So, you know, just kind of, it is what it is. And what we're working on is... uh uh, greater strength in the language about supervisors working that, are, that gives us money. And the reason it gives us money, uh, well, first off is I'm poor and broke, and so I like having money in general because eating is good. But looking politically at it, what we say is, hey, there's an economic incentive for people to get involved with the union and get involved with the union process. It's, it's it's material that they, you know, it buys them lunch. So what what increases that is good. What decreases that is bad. But like that's kind of at, at, I hate to say it, the very elementary stages that we're at right now, in my in my view. But uh, uh, Matt, you may have different views. Well, I guess what I'd like to say to that is uh, this is a minimum maximum program question. And to remark on what Stephanie said about the transitional program, uh, this is ultimately an issue for any socialist serious about changing society. A lot of socialists feel like they've found the holy grail of revolutionary ideas when they pick up Trotsky's manifesto on revolution, uh, the death agony of capitalism and the tasks of the Fourth International. So for generations of orthodox Trotskyists, the conclusion was, uh, in order to make a revolution, you just needed to get the right program. So the question for me is why this obviously uh, wound up being a dead end. And to kind of connect this back with some of the stuff I was talking about earlier, uh, I feel like one of the lessons to be drawn from this is that this is something that Trotskyism and Maoism seem to have in common during this period in the 1970s. Uh, there seemed to be a general ideological notion that the received theory of Marxism-Leninism was sufficient, theoretically. And while it certainly had to be applied to concrete conditions in the United States, uh, for them, the big theoretical questions uh, were thought to have been solved. So I think this lent itself to a kind of fetish of ideological purity in the different trends of the new communist movement. 
um, or a certain type of voluntarism that sort of attempted to leap over objective conditions. And uh, we saw glimpses of this. Uh, we saw glimpses of these problems uh, when they came through again around Seattle uh, in, in the World Trade Organization protests in 1999. Um, but with respect to the nuts and bolts of labor politics, like Greg was describing, and how they fit into the task of building revolutionary politics, um, in the old pre-World War I social democratic parties, there had been two programs. Uh, a minimum program for uh, immediate attainable demands and a maximum one for when a socialist society could be built. And naturally, the first became the guide to daily work and was kind of evacuated of revolutionary ambition, uh, while the other was mostly relegated to late night uh, utopian talks between socialists. Uh, so the Trotsky's program was aimed at bridging the gap between the two uh, by raising demands which were achievable, uh, but also challenged the dominance of the existing order. In other words, they were demands that posed the question of power. Uh, but the problem is you can't cast these in stone. Uh, they have to flow from the specific needs of the struggle that you're engaged in. Uh, for example, tax the rich was in no way a transitional demand in the boom years following World War II. Um, but today it's fundamentally counter hegemonic to demand, uh, to demand it because it raises the question of who should pay for the crisis and who caused it and why a tiny minority subordinate the rest of us. And all these things challenge the dominance of free market ideology. Uh, and all this really has to do with how socialists put forward ideas because there's a big difference between propagandizing a lot of ideas to a small number of people, and uh, between that and agitating for a few ideas to the many, uh, which is important because socialists need both. Like, you can't make some great speech to popular acclaim, but then not follow that up uh, afterwards, like sitting down. Uh, with a smaller number to win them over to your revolutionary strategy and ideas. Um, so I guess I'll say that I think one more category is perhaps necessary here, which is concrete propaganda, uh, because sometimes you have to engage in concrete propaganda to gain support among a significant minority. Uh, to the extent that it could move on to become a demand which wins majority support within the broader working class as the struggle develops. For example, like during the Greek financial crisis, uh, the argument that they needed a general strike to defeat austerity started to pick up steam beyond the far left. Uh, in other words, it became concrete propaganda. Uh, but a lot of the people who were pushing this me message started raising it 24-7 as an agitational demand which didn't really match the dominant mood of the working class at the time. So there's no point in agitating for a general strike if you can't realistically advance it a single iota. And that's really what Greg and I are grappling with here. It's not like labor in the United States doesn't know it's in bad shape. It does. The issue is whether or not it has the will to do what's necessary to save it, which is to strike. because. Everyone with real political power and influence in this country, they're quite skilled at turning pub the public against it. So it's a matter of timing and political judgment. And we think right now the time is right for something serious. And maybe that could apply some significant pressure on labor and hopefully on the left more broadly uh, about its unconditional support for the Democrats, which has stood by for the last half century and done nothing while the labor movement has been decimated. So that's the idea, anyway. So I guess just to wrap things up here, uh, my ultimate point is that I'm not advocating for some kind of eclecticism as a response to the new communist movement's rigid ideas about organization. 
Uh, I think what we need is something Greg asserted a couple years back when he spoke at Platypus's international convention, uh, which is that we need to find a very particular Marxism that works for today. There's a general crisis of Marxism in socialism more broadly in the industrialized imperialist world today. And Greg went on to say, uh, what does Marxism look like today internationally? It looks like Maoism. Now, what do I think it would look like for the United States? I don't think it's Maoism. I'm sorry, I don't. But if we're being honest here, uh, which is, I presume, why we're having this conversation, right? Then I have no idea. But whatever it is, I'm convinced it's not just a question of organization, but really a deeper question of revolutionary leadership, which is something quite different. Okay, um, so actually, I was wondering if I could ask a question about this. Um, and so I wanted to ask about this question of leadership and maybe just be like really simple about it, you know, because I know, Greg, you've been involved in revolutionary Chicago. And like my understanding is that this is kind of an attempt to deal with the problem. So maybe you could speak to that. But what is revolutionary leadership and what is it today specifically? Like what needs do we have in terms of leadership today? Oh, well, as long as it's a real easy question for me. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, um, you know, I'll put it bluntly. Um, to be, to be a leader today, uh, and what is needed from leadership today, uh, is to be the first out of the trench. Um, I, I think I do all right, uh, speaking. I do all right teaching. Uh, I had the possibility to get a nice PhD in uh, philosophy and get somewhere. Uh, instead, I became a dirty stagehand with a Oxy Local 99 in Utah, and here I'm a Teamster 705. Um, it's hard work, and Matt can tell you, it is hard work. Um, as far as uh, revolutionary leadership, um, all we can do is what we can do. Uh, the reason why Matt uh, is at uh, the, the Teamster locale that he's at. Uh, it has a whole host of reasons, and a whole host of reasons, and uh, one of them was uh, a mistaken idea that I think this is going to be okay. Um, but it's all right, because now he's part of uh, UPS, and he's working, and hopefully he's going to be a Teamster during this critical struggle. Um but that's the thing, is leadership is not based on uh, writing uh, the right position, uh, because there's, there's libraries and libraries of Trotsky's groups that have the right position if only everyone listened to them. And where are they now? You know, I think I saw two or three of them outside of my local handing out uh, uh, newspapers. Uh, you know, uh, the Maoists. They had the right leadership. They they wrote rings upon rings, and and what's left of them? Oh well, that's uh, our, uh, Bob Aiken and the RCT, who has now written the the correct leadership that if we only all followed, um, we would uh, we would have revolution tomorrow. Um, as far as leadership goes in this variety, I'm not interested in it. Uh, my question. When we're talking about leadership, and especially what we're talking about leadership, is what what are you trying to accomplish? How are you trying to accomplish it? What are you going to do? And it's the what are you going to do that gets leftists, socialists, anarchists, uh, Marxists, Leninists, Maoists, every time. What are you going to do? Um, and quite frankly, uh, I, I get, I can get a book report on, on Trotsky and the third period and Stalin and the failures of the new left. But when I ask, what are you gonna do? Uh, I don't get any response. I, I get awkward shifting and looking at their shoes. And, uh, well, I would, I would, I would join UPS, but, oh, uh, it's just not, it's not a good time right now. Um, you know, oh, I, I think this, uh, seems to stuff is vital. Yeah, okay, maybe you might be right about the union. But, you know, I, uh, you know, financially, so, you know, what, what does leadership look like? Uh, I'll let you know when we have some. 
Um, what I can say is these are the things that I, I, I want to see. People who say, what, what am I trying to do? How are we going to do it? And they say, so I'm going to do it. Um, because I'm, I'm very, very much tired of the leftist, uh, of all varieties, all varieties, leftists of all varieties, writing a plan for revolution and then handing it over and saying, here, follow this and this will lead you to revolution. I'll, I'll be back in my, my, uh, my, uh, apartment, uh, drinking a mojito. Let me know how it goes. I, I just really, uh, am, am tired of that attitude. Which again, I, if I come across as hostile, it's not to you, but I'm very, I'm, I think the question of revolutionary leadership is vital and it's important. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the question, at least for the length of my lifetime, has remained unanswered. But uh, I'm sure Matt's got a, a good response that, uh, that uh, addresses this. Oh, I definitely have a response. Um, I'm not sure if it's what anyone's looking for. Uh, but I got one. Uh, Greg, I, I agree with you on a certain things here, but we also have some real serious points of departure. So I guess I'll be begin by saying that I'm not so sure the problem is a lack of boots on the ground. Because in my view, there's a lot of leftist activity going on today. Uh, but what underlies it is a, this sort of vague anti-authorian or this vague anti-authoritarianism of the new left along with the Communist Party's popular front politics of the 1930s. And what it's led to is ideological incoherence into a, a left that's entered into a sort of false unity that's completely untenable. And I do expect this to come to a head in the DSA sooner or later. Uh, but that's a different issue. Uh, what I'd really like to say here is that without constant discussion and debate about the meaning of this political activity, then it's just self-perpetuating. It only leads to more protest activism, and which is, by its sheer virtue of existence, uh, supposed to galvanize the political consciousness of its onlookers. And the content of this politicization is rarely called into question. Uh, instead, people expect the struggle will inherently work through its own ideological problems. And that's just not the case. Not at all. Uh, now, I will say it's important to be fair here because there are certainly leftists who will say that the development of ideas is integral to building radical culture and yada yada. But at the same time, there's very little activity in today's movement for that. Uh, there's almost no follow-up work done on the kind of organizational work necessary to foster an examination of history and to develop an analysis of political positions in the development of theory. And right now, I think that's what revolutionary leadership looks like. I don't know how you can say that the problem is just that people don't do anything. They do all the time. There's a protest against Trump every single day. There's probably one happening right now. It never ends, yet it changes next to nothing, and so it chews people up and spits them out. They become deeply pe pessimistic about what's possible, and then they drop out. And they've been doing this for decades. And people's lives get wasted. It's how entire generations get discarded. It's how the new left went from trying to make the revolution to saying, well, I was young, I had no idea what I was doing, violence isn't the answer, you can't change the world, and you should just grow up and vote Obama. Suck it up. I did. And that's the sad reality of it, Greg. It has nothing to do with an aversion to engage in real activity. In fact, the left today makes a virtue out of doing hard work that doesn't do anything except offers some sort of weird subculture. And you know what? I don't need politics to find that. I'm better off without it, because then I don't have to think about how the left is dead. I came into socialism as a musician, and, you know, I can go right back to the local indie scene or whatever if that's what I was looking for. 
Uh, instead, I got into politics because I find the present moment unbearable. I think the ideological culture of the sectarian and activist left is the problem. And I think it stems from a lack of discipline, which is related but distinct. Uh, because right now, nobody takes politics seriously. Not really. So, whatever kind of person you are, if you're serious about changing the world, whether it's just on an interpersonal level with talking to people about their politics, or whether you're an intellectual in academia, maybe, or someone in a socialist organization, or whatever, what you need to do is to challenge the fundamental assumptions. Uh, you need to embody the spirit of the ruthless criticism of everything to the people around you, and you need, need to demand that they clarify their political questions and differences with other people, even at the expense of them being hated, and at the expense of them potentially hating you. Uh, because changing the world, it's, it's not easy. It's hard. It's not fun. It's not rewarding. And it's definitely not about making friends. So that's what I think revolutionary leadership looks like today, is doing those things, even if it means going it alone. Um, you know, if I may, and I, I know this is a problem since, uh, you know, you're having some phone issues that you could get somewhere that has a little better reception there. I think we'd all really appreciate it. Um, and that's all good. Everything you said is all good. But let me ask you this. You know, all sorts of people, nationally, internationally, you know, leftists, who's going to go throw boxes with you? Because I've been there, you're going there, it sucks. It really sucks. And so we can, we can talk about the labor aristocracy, we can talk about the bureaucratization of unions, we can talk about Stalinist this, now with that, Trotsky, whatever. But who's going to do the hard work that's throwing boxes? And that's what the left doesn't have. We, we, I would like to say that we have, uh, you know, a million leaders, but no soldiers. But we don't have a million leaders, because to become a leader in the left, you actually have to go into the trenches and do the stuff that isn't fun. And, and that's what I'm saying. Uh, for me, at least, um, you know, you say you want a revolution, um, you know, bury the picture of Tiernan now. I don't care. But you know what? Go into Teamsters and help me build Teamsters into a real organization that can stop the, the, the inner, inner, uh, flow of imperialism to the U.S. and the rest of the world. You know? You, you have great, one has great ideas on Trotsky and how evil Stalinists bureaucratize, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. Then go get a union job that, 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 and build, and build up the rank and file. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, we're talking about unions here, but, you know, you know, it, it, you, across the board, immigrant rights, uh, you know, police shootings, um, you know, it, you, you just have to, like, pick anything. And we can discuss, and we should, we should. I just, I just finished reading a book by Elaine Madu today. Uh, I read it, I got off work, I went to Barnes & Noble, I read it, and, and now I'm here talking to you. I love theory. I was a philosophy graduate. Um, but the fact of the matter is, if we're looking concretely at what we need now, we need people who will do stuff, not people who have opinions on stuff. And, and good, Big caveat. I think because we're getting to we're getting oh. right on three, but um, maybe you know your last word. Um, my point is, uh, thank you, Matt, because you actually put your money where your mouth is, and you go do the hard, arduous job that is <laughs> the team. Hey, no problem. And you, yeah. Okay, thanks so much, Greg, and thanks, Matt. So that was Greg Lucero and uh, Matt JC um, on our uh, on Radical Minds, and so you can catch us every Thursday at two p.m. Uh, for more. Thank you so much. Feels 
It's for so long, it's not true. Wanted a woman, never bargained for you. Lots of people talking, few of them know. Soul of a woman was created for love. 